We have all seen the no license required headlines for part 103 ultralights by now. With Aerolite 103 being one of the most popular choices, I figured we should do a factory tour and show you exactly how it's made. The Aerolite 103 is produced by U Fly It Light Sport Aircraft LLC, located at the Deland Municipal Airport in Deland, Florida. Let me introduce you to Dennis and have him give us a factory tour. Okay, I'm Dennis Carley and uh, this is Aerolite 103. Uh, what you see on the rack here is all uh, 6061 T6, it's all clear anodized for corrosion resistance. Um, Almost the entire airframe is aluminum, about 6061 T6 aluminum. There are a few parts, uh, nose gear parts and uh, main gear axles that are uh, 4130 welded, but that is the only steel components of the, uh, of the airframe. And what are some of the typical sizes and thicknesses of metal that you use in the build? Uh, a lot of it is one inch uh, 035 wall. Wing spars, uh, front and rear are both two inch. Uh, leading edge is 058 wall. And, it's 049 on the uh, uh, trailing edge. Lift struts, uh, inch and a half, 035. So a lot of it is uh, 035 wall up to uh, 058 wall. Uh, almost all the hardware is uh, standard aircraft grade AN, AN hardware. And uh, uh, there is a handful of bolts that are metric, which are, you know, no AN bolts for those. Those are grade eight or grade 10 bolts. That's usually in the engine installation. All right, so from the raw material shelf, Obviously, you've got to cut it down to size, so walk us through the next steps of cutting or forming the metal. Yep, okay, so we take those uh, tubes, uh, once we get them back from the anodizer, uh, we've got a cut book over here for every part of the aircraft. We've also got a master part for every part of the aircraft. We take that, set the saw up here, we've got a stop block for the various lengths. That lets us cut all the tubes uh, to length, whether it be round, square, rectangular, whatever it is. That gets cut here, then it gets deburred, and then after it's deburred, uh, we drill, bend, and then fabricate into the uh, into the jigs. Now, is any of this uh, CNC, or do you have like templates made for even for drilling? Uh, not, it's not done by templates, and we have some components, uh, some like lift strut gusset plates. Those are produced by a, a CNC company for us. We don't do that in-house, but all of the tubes on the aircraft that are round or, or square or rectangular, we cut that, drill it, and bend it here, and then you know put it together in the jigs for the final uh, final um, components. The We have a stop blocks for length and stopping locations on the drill uh, jig as well. So if we know that this tube, we're gonna cut this tube, we can set the stop block on here to the right coordinates, put the raw material up there, turn the chop saw on and cut as many of them as we want to cut. Okay, so after we cut these, Brian, every every one of these tubes, again, whether it be square, round, rectangular, whatever it is, we have a deburring wheel here. So we'll bring it over to the deburring wheel, turn that wheel on, touch the ends, touch the uh, edges, just to make that smooth, inside and outside. And then if the part after the raw piece is, uh, is deburred, Let's say that gets cut to uh, an angle and then gets a, a, a rivet hole put into it, a pilot hole put into it. It comes back over here again after it's cut. That angle gets deburred a second time for a finished part. So if we have a component that has a fairly tight radius bend in it after the tube is, uh, is cut to length, we bring it over here to this bender. We have dies for all the diameters that, uh, that we use in the aircraft and we have uh, bending coordinates. We have a bending sheet for each component. So we'll put that in there, lock it in place, and then we'll pull, you know, pull the tube around the die to bend it to whatever that particular radius is for, for that, uh, that tube. Now, most metals have a bit of a spring back, and I think especially aluminum. So do you have like a template that as you pull it off, depending on what day, how cold or hot it is, your spring back changes, so you just have a template to match it up with, or? Uh, not a template, but we have, again, we have a master part for every one. So we've got a, if we know we're putting a 30 degree bend in this tube, we have a master part with that 30 degree bend. So if we put this lot of aluminum in here and we bend it, usually if we bend it to the coordinates that we have for that particular tube, 
it comes out correctly or within a half a degree or so. But each run of aluminum is slightly different. So if we have, you know, if we bend it around to that tube and it comes out of the, the bender here at a half a degree less than what it needs to be, we know we need to make an adjustment. So we have small increments on this bender that we can then adjust it to get it to the right one and then that batch of aluminum all that all the tubes will just compensate for it accordingly and do you typically do kind of batch runs of parts that they're on the shelf ready to pull for production yeah and it's uh it depends on what the part is you know how many of them we we use per airplane but a lot of this stuff that is you know if it's a small part and we're making it from the drop of another piece we're cutting we, if we've got 50 pieces of it, we'll just go ahead and make 50 parts out of it. And then it, you know, it's, it's put back on the shelf and, and we have it when we need it. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, you know, a station there where we cut e each of these tubes to length. We have a drill press here, same bench. We have a drilling book that has the coordinates for every hole in every tube on the airplane. And we also have a master part that corresponds with that. So. If we know we're going to make uh, root tubes, for instance, we'll take those cut root tubes, they've already been deburred, we'll bring it over here, we'll open up the book to the root tube, it gives us the coordinates for the first hole, we set the drill up for that, you know, with the stop block in the right place, and then we take the master part, lay it up here, bring the drill press down into it just to verify that we've got it in the right spot. And it just sequentially, each hole on each side then gets drilled from that point. Hey everyone, let me take just a moment here to thank our sponsors that make all of this possible. Great companies like Airworks, AirTech Coatings, Clemens Insurance Agency, Whelan Aerospace Technologies. So take a moment after this video to say hello to all of them and remember to check out the affiliate links in the description below. Hey, if you like this episode, leave a comment below. Let me know your thoughts on the Aerolite 103. So after we have the parts cut, um, uh, we bring those parts into uh, these jigs uh, and build as many control services, uh, ailerons, flaps, elevators, rudder, horizontal stabilizer and vertical fin are all made in these jigs. Then we have a wing jig for the uh, wing panels. Okay, so these are put together similar to any tube and fabric, like if you're to weld, but instead you use gusset and rivet, rivets, correct? Yep, that's exactly correct, yep. So we have one wing jig for both left and right wings. And what we do with that is um, we set the components, each, each piece, into the, into the jig, and then we, we position the, the rear spar at a certain point to determine if it's going to be left or right. And that is basically the lift strut gusset plate holes curve inboard to meet the uh, lift strut. So if we pin it one way, it's a left wing. If we pin it the other way, it's a right wing. Uh, we, when those tubes are all in the jigs, it goes together on the top side with these gusset plates. Once that's all done and fixed in place, it comes out of the jig flips over to the other side, goes back in the jig, and the gusset plates are put on the opposite side of the frame. Okay. Now, I've seen different manufacturers decide on different style of rivets. Some use aluminum to aluminum, some use stainless steel to aluminum. What do you use to build yours? It's a structural rivet. It's a steel, mandrel, and an aluminum rivet. Uh, it's sealed, so it, you know it's uh, not an open pop rivet like some of them that allow moisture to get in the inside of it. Has a, I think it's 860 pounds shear strength per rivet, so it's a pretty robust structural rivet. So, how are the control cables or push pull tubes or whatever you use to control your your flight services run through your wings? Um, on the wings, uh, it's uh, a push pull cable for both the flap control and the aileron control. The uh, flap cable is fixed in here. Uh, the aileron cable runs down through this conduit. It, it's done like that on the aileron cable, so if you take the wing off the fuselage, if you're disassembling it for transport, 
all you have to do is disconnect it at the uh, aileron horn and just pull the cable right out of the conduit and coil it up on the fuselage. The Aerolite 103 is a true ultralight and a pilot's license is not required. So if this looks like fun to you, it's time for you to start flying. All right, Dennis, so moving more away from the wings and control surfaces, now we're getting into the, the true airframe or fuselage. So yep. where do you start on, on that aspect of it? Well, un, unlike the, all the other control surfaces and the wing panels we've looked at, there's not a table jig that these are built in. There are, there are jigging components that go onto these to keep them square, you know, whether it be vertical or in you know, the mass tube coming off at 90 degrees or whatever. But these are pretty much just done on a rolling cart here. And we take the, you know, the gear mass plates and the gear legs go in, the mass tube goes in, the, the brace tubes go in, uh, like you see the battery mounts on here, the, that's the shoulder harness um, uh, attachment point. There's a down tube on the back of it here. And then from that point, the rest of that fuselage just basically gets built around that. So this is truly the, the backbone of the design right here. Yeah, this is the start of, what, of putting the fuselage together. And then what you see behind us here, are, well, that one's complete. This one's uh, complete except for the dash panel has to be put in it yet. All right, well, walk us through like a sample. If I were to receive this at home, obviously I'll inventory the kit. And if I wanted to start building the fuselage portion, obviously we just talked about the backbone. Where do you go from there in the build? Well, when you get the kit, this is how it rolls off the trailer at, at you in your driveway. This is all put together just like this. So everything comes as a quick build. Just yeah, exactly. We have we have one kit, and that's a quick build kit. There's there's no lesser assembled version available. So this fuselage, as you see it here, gear, brake, seat, tank, fuel, uh, control cables, all that stuff is in when you get it. What do you actually have to do when you get this kit? Well, there you know. We, we refer to this as an assembly kit, not a construction kit. A lot of times you get what a manufacturer calls a, a kit, and it's basically raw materials with some of that cut to length, some of the you know pilot holes and stuff drilled, but you've got to bend, form, you know, you've got to make your own jigs for this, some of this stuff, depending on what, what stage of completion that particular manufacturer's kit is in. What we do is we basically do every part of the assembly or, or the uh, the fabrication of the assembly up to the final assembly so when it leaves here as a kit you are not really constructing the basic components you are taking those components doing the final assembly you're covering uh, rigging engine goes in you have to put your instruments in instrument panel wire that stuff up um, but you don't have to bend any tubes. You don't have to weld anything. Uh, you're, you're riveting things together. You know, there's a couple hundred rivets in the kit. You're putting hinges in for the control surfaces and so on. But all that stuff is basically final assembly or final type assembly. So to compare this to some people who are new to the ultralight or aviation world, this might be like a rolling chassis compared to like a, a, a car. All right, Dennis, since you're already sitting there, <laughs> why don't you describe to us the controls that are unique to this uh, this airplane here? Okay, so you know a lot of uh, uh, light aircraft or ultralights use a uh, stick. This uh, this design, when it was designed back in the late 90s, was originally designed with this same butterfly yoke that you see here currently. Uh, my understanding was is that when Terry designed the airplane, he was operating off of some survey that EAA had taken of their members and they asked them what is your preference in a single seat ultralight aircraft and it was high wing, aluminum tube, um, sailcloth covering and yoke by about 70 percent which surprised me and I don't know if that's still still the same today or not but we uh, we get a request for a stick probably I don't know, five or six times a year out of several hundred inquiries. So it doesn't seem to be anything that keeps somebody away from this particular plane. But the controls um, for, you saw the control uh, cable for the flaps in the wing, Teleflex cable. We use the same cables on the ailerons and uh, on the uh, elevators. The, um, the only control cable that is not a Teleflex cable 
is uh, rudder cables and that is a straight run aircraft uh, stainless aircraft cable with no pulleys so basically all of the control surfaces and all the control cables you don't have any slop in them at all the hydraulic brakes are standard on every aircraft uh, for till about two years ago um, mechanical brakes were used from clear back to the late 90s up to a couple years ago. Now we use a Black Max hydraulic brake. So the actuator's here on the, uh, the stick and this is pinned in place. So all you do is just squeeze the brakes. Um, we use the same braking system on every set of wheels and tires, regardless of the size of the wheels and tires. So how many different engine options and horsepower options do you have for these? Well, uh, currently we use five primary engines and those range in horsepower from 28 to 63. We use um, MZ and Hearth are the two primary engines. <clears throat> we also occasionally use uh, Kawasaki 340 and 440 engines. All right, we've seen the construction and the, some of the assembly. Walk us through if we actually were ready to fly one of these. What is the pre-flight and engine start procedure? Well, you know, the, the, the pre-flight on a walk around on, on our plane and most other planes of this type, I, I often tell people that, you know, when you walk around this airplane to do a pre-flight, you literally get to see nearly every nut and every bolt and every, you know, every controls uh, component. They call that an annual inspection on big airplanes, you know, because you have to pull all these inspection plates off to see those things. But here we walk around it and we literally look at all the structural bolts that attach the, you know, the components together on the airplane. Uh, we start here, we start here to lift struts and just work our way around, Brian, and we look at uh, the, the bolts, the, the fasteners, the self-locking nuts, same thing out here when we get out to the, uh, to the uh, lift strut gusset plates at the upper end. Jury struts, same thing, checking the hardware and the brackets for, uh, for cracks. And when we get to the back side of the wing, <clears throat> we check the uh, castle nuts and cotter pins and the hinges on uh, all the control surfaces, ailerons and flaps. <clears throat> we check the connections on the uh, aileron horn and the flap horns. Check the rear lift struts, bolts for the upper and lower tail booms. We always check the bolts at the bottom on the uh, axles as well. Prop bolts to make sure the safety wire is still there. And then we come back to the back, <coughs> lift strut um, uh, tubes on the uh, stabilizers, check the fasteners there, brackets on the uh, uh, horizontal stabilizer, teleflex cables at the uh, elevators, same thing on the rudder, <coughs> rudder horn at the bottom of the rudder, that's the aft end of those cables we were talking about uh, earlier. They have aircraft turnbuckles on the uh, cable, so we check the safety wire on that as well. All right, a little different camera angle here to capture what we're doing here. Yeah, so when we build these planes, uh, whether we do it here as a ready to fly or we send it out as a kit, all the switch plates are overhead. And the, the engines that we offer currently all have electric start. I'll use a lightweight lithium battery for the starter. So we flip the master switch on and switch both mag switches on. Um, depending on which engine it is, it will either have a primer or a choke. So you engage the primer or uh, operate the uh, uh, choke. And then it's got a momentary contact switch to, uh, to engage the starter. And that's it. So we're, we're very bare bones on instruments here, but I see once floating along the fuselage, what is, what is like the rotation speed? What do you climb out at, cruise at, stall at, all that stuff? Uh, well, to address your, what you're talking about, this, in, this hall airspeed indicator, you know, this has been around on ultralights since I think the, probably the late 70s, mid to late 70s. Simple principle, it's got a little ram air port here at the bottom, which that ram air lifts that diaphragm up and there's a graduated scale there for miles per hour. So it reads accurately down to 10 miles an hour. A lot of the in-panel uh, standard aircraft uh, airspeed indicators don't really read accurately below about 40. 
And so we have a plane like ours that stalls at you know 28 or 30 miles an hour. That doesn't do you much good. Uh, hall airspeed indicator, and we put this on every airplane, send it with every kit. That works really, really well. Um, we generally, uh, at about 30 miles an hour, we give it a little back pressure. If you just lighten up the load on the nose there, it'll fly itself right off the ground. Uh, we generally climb between 40 and 45 miles an hour. And a lot of the higher thrust engines that we use, you do not need full power to get it off the ground. You bring it to 50, 60 percent power, uh, it's off the ground very quickly. And then if you want to maximize that climb rate, you can add the rest of that power back in and bring the nose up and climb. And you know, with this high horsepower stuff, Brian, it'll climb darn near 45 degrees. It's you're looking at the sky. There's nothing else there. It's pretty much uh, not for the faint of heart. Cruise depends on the engine. If you're using the single cylinder uh, F33 or MZ34, those will cruise 50 to 55 miles an hour. Uh, if you're using the higher, the 40 horsepower above, that'll cruise 60 to 65 miles an hour. And uh, we approach, uh, if it's calm air and you've got a little time in the airplane, 40 miles an hour is fine. If it's a little bumpy, between 40 and 45, and then it'll touch down 35, 32 to 35, somewhere in that range. So this has a feature I just realized and noticed that uh, a lot of ultralights don't, and that you have flaps. We do, yeah. Electric flaps, uh, 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 that's standard on every airplane. And yeah, the switch for that's overhead. It has about 30 degrees of travel. And that, uh, that change, extending those flaps, slows the stall speed down about, no, oh, probably two or three miles an hour. Uh, but it does allow you to, if you're coming into a short field or over a, uh, you know, an obstacle, you can definitely steepen up that approach by, by extending the flaps. All right, Dennis, well, thank you very much for the tour, how it's made walkthrough. And if people want to get a hold of you to ask you more questions or to actually buy one of these, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, best place is through our website. It's www.fly103.com. Scroll down to the bottom of any page. There's a telephone number and an email link. And lastly, uh, we're in January 2021. Obviously, pricing can change at any time throughout the years, but at this moment in time, what is the price point for a kit, which obviously is very far along, or a ready-to-fly? Uh, it varies a little bit on the ready-to-fly, depending on what engine you use, but the, uh, the complete airframe kit is uh, 13700 No price increases uh, anticipated here anytime uh, coming up soon. Uh, that includes hydraulic brakes, um, covering in your choice of colors, uh, aluminum fuel tank, you know, all the options that we have uh, on, the, on the basic airplane. And then the engine packages start at about four, a little over 4,000 and run up to about uh, a little under 8,000, depending on what uh, motor. Okay. Well, again, thank you for the tour, and uh, I'll have to stop in and see how things are progressing through the years. All right. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Experimental Aircraft Channel. I invite you to subscribe, like, and hit all those notifications. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.